you have your Bibles, would you turn with us to 2 Corinthians, the third chapter. We're going to be reading verses 7 through 18. Stand with us out of honor and respect to God's holy word. Now, if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory, so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, fading though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that condemns men is glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was fading away came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We're not like Moses who would put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from gazing at it while the radiance was fading away. But their minds were made dull, for to this day the same veil remains when the old covenant is, uh, when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all who with unveiled faces reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Thank you. You may be seated. I remember a sermon that I heard, which is remarkable because I heard it 40 years ago. Anybody here remember a sermon that they heard 40 years ago? Well, there's one. We're not going to ask you to pre-preach it for us. Actually, I need to be more specific. I remember one phrase of a sermon that I heard 40 years ago. I had a uh, preaching professor that... uh, that told me one time that if your people could remember what you said to them as they were walking to the car that morning, that you were doing well. So I'm a little surprised that I still remember what this one preacher, who I thought was a little strange, to be honest, what he said to me and that I retain it 40 years later. He was doing better than he knew. He started his sermon this way. Boy, am I enthused! I thought he was weird. I thought, what's wrong with this guy? Now, I confess, I don't remember much more about the content of that message that day. (laughs) But as I've reflected on what's being said in the passage that we just read, I think that's the response we ought to have to what's being said here. I'll give you a little bit of background. Um... When you go back and you study how words came into being, that's called etymology. You don't have to remember that. 
But the word enthused is made of two words. The first part, en, means in. Okay, that's not hard. And the last part of the word, thused, well, that comes from the Greek word theos, which is God. God in us is essentially what that means. So the word enthused means God in us. And, and we're talking today on the day of Pentecost about the Holy Spirit's coming, which is the time that God came to live inside all of us. Boy, am I enthused. You see, that's a very legitimate thing to say. Now, I've learned something from Pastor Walt. I've learned a lot of things from Pastor Walt. They're good things. You're okay. You're okay. But when he's dealing with the choir, he won't let them sing an enthusiastic song, kind of like, boy, am I enthused. No, 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 no. If you're going to sing, boy, am I enthused, you're going to do it with enthusiasm. Can you do it with me? Boy, am I enthused. Okay, see, they know how to do that. And they're going to lead you. Because anytime I say boy, you know what's coming. Boy. Am I they got it. Do you have it? Boy. Oh, that was pathetic. <laughs> Wasn't that pathetic? If, if they're enthused, they sure don't sound like it. Boy. That's better. Okay. You see, the work of the Holy Spirit enables God to live in us. If anyone, anywhere, anytime has reason to be enthused, it's the people of God in Christ Jesus. Here's what Scripture says. And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Now, it's one thing to get enthused about today, but what about the rest of our life? Is being enthused occasionally it's getting all pumped up and excited, really, what it's about? Is it about stirring ourselves up emotionally so we create a huge surge of adrenaline that causes us to get excited? Or is lasting enthusiasm better built on a firm foundation of knowing God and what he is up to in us? I think there is an underlying foundation to what God is doing that creates for us the opportunity for a lasting enthusiasm. Christians get enthused about tomorrow because by following the Holy Spirit's leading today, our walk with Jesus can just keep getting better every day. Boy! Good. Now, get enthused because with the Spirit of Christ in us, we are free to be just who God made us to be. It says, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Well, from what are we freed? Well, Jesus came to free us from two important things. He came to free us from sin's practices and he came to free us from sin's control of our sinful, uh, from the control of the sinful nature in us. It was a, um, a father who was talking with his daughter. It was during a family vacation, and his one daughter, Sarah, got a little ornery and pushed her younger sister, Hannah. When Dad looked at, uh, at 
at Sarah and he said, did you push Hannah? And she said, no, I didn't do it. But this is becoming a growing pattern for Sarah. And he said, I decided to take a walk with her to get to the bottom of things. Sarah, I told her, you really disappointed me with your behavior. What do you need it? What do you need to do about it? He said, I expected Sarah to tell me that she needed to stop lying or to apologize to her sister. But instead, with tears in her eyes, she said, I need to ask Jesus into my heart. He said, there I was zeroing in on changing her behavior. My six-year-old daughter was dealing with the bigger issues of needing forgiveness, cleansing, and internal spiritual change. I was focused on morality. She was focused on spirituality that makes morality possible and sincere. God created us in his own image. But sin's invasion wrecked the image of God in us so that we no longer are who God made us to be. However, the good news is that the Spirit of Christ is given to us so that the image of God may be repaired and that we once again may become who God intends us to be. What sin ruined in us, the Spirit of Christ repairs and restores so that we might become just who God wants us to be. In Colossians 3, 9 and 10, it reads this way, you have taken off your old self with its practices and you've put on your new self which is being renewed in the knowledge in the image of its creator. Get enthused. God has given us a way to overcome the devastating effects of sin and to once again be who he made us to be. That's exciting. Paul Rees says it this way. The real accent in the New Testament is not on how human I am, but, who, but on how Christian I can be. Do you, do you understand that? The emphasis in the New Testament isn't about how much we fail, but how much God can change us and make us into his new creation, totally transformed, totally revolutionized, totally regenerated. And that indeed is exciting. Get enthused because the spirit of Christ in us frees us to be just who God made us to be. Boy, good. yeah, good. And get enthused because the Holy Spirit is helping us to become better and better reflectors of Christ's glory. In, in 2 Corinthians 3.18, it says, And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory. What does it mean to reflect the Lord's glory? Well, the Lord's glory is his holiness. And apart from Jesus, we can never reflect his holiness because we don't have any. When people look at us apart from what God does in us, what they see hardly reflects holiness. This, about three months ago, we left church in the evening it was, uh, it was a Sunday night, and it was the time of year when it's dark outside when we leave church. It was amazing 
the, the moon was off in that direction. And you know how the moon generally looks about that big? It looked humongous that night. It was a full moon, and it was as bright as any moon that I have ever seen. I was just amazed. As a matter of fact, we were not so only amazed as we, as we left church, but all the way home, even though the moon was behind us, we could, we could see its reflection. It was, it was lighting up everything. It was so big that night. Got to thinking about the moon and how it's a reflector. It doesn't have any light of its own. It only reflects the light that the sun gives to it. It's kind of like us. We don't have any holiness of our own. No, the holiness that we have, it, it's got to come from God. He, he alone is the source of holiness. Any good that we reflect, any holiness that we reflect, any, any positive that we reflect is only because it's him being shown through us. When people look at us, if they see his holiness, it's because it's his reflection showing forth in us. The Holy Spirit helps us. He cleanses us from what hinders our reflecting God's glory and makes it possible for others to see the glory of Christ in us. Let me ask this one question. When people see your life, do they see in you the likeness of God's glory reflected? If they do, you can say with us, boy, am I enthused. Get enthused because God's Spirit is helping us to become more and more like Jesus himself. Scripture says we are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory. The Holy Spirit helps us to take on the character of Christ. Daniel Taylor observes that character is not something you have. It's something you are that inevitably shows itself in what you do. Character, not something you have, but something you are that shows itself in what you do. I like that. Character is what we are on the inside. One person said that Christian personality is hidden deep inside us. And then he, he likened it to a, a fancy restaurant. You know the restaurants where the, where the uh, waiters walk around with the, the trays up above their heads and, and sometimes they carry, uh, carry uh, little containers that, uh, that may hold the gravy or whatever and, and they walk around and, and, and hold it. And, and when they're holding it up, you can't really see what's inside. Unless somebody trips them. <laughs> then you see it's splattered all over the place, what's inside. There are times that we really can't tell what's inside us until somebody bumps us. When they bump us, we find out what spills out, what comes out unexpectedly. Character is what we are on the inside. And what we are on the inside is supposed to be, well, filled with the fruit of the Spirit, love and joy and peace, patience. Hmm, that one's hard. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, 
gentleness and self-control. When you get bumped, what spills out? The process of becoming more and more Christ-like is not automatic. There's no spiritual cruise control. You know, cruise control, you kind of set your car at one speed and it stays there. Uh, no, it's not set it and forget it to become more like Christ. Christ-likeness, it must be nurtured, must be developed. We must hunger to be more like him and intentionally seek to become less like us. But when we nurture and develop Christ's character in us, we can become more and more like him. We do that as we humbly read God's word and let Christ be formed in us. We do that as we reverently worship with God's people and let Jesus shape us. We do that when we pray and when we study and when we read in fellowship with God's people, adopting more and more of the mind and heart of Jesus Christ. We do that becoming more and more like our Lord himself. Get enthused because God's spirit is helping us become more like Jesus himself. Life isn't always easy, is it? We face things that we never asked for, never wanted, never desired. We face challenges we just never choose if we got to pick. But in spite of the fact that life sometimes gets tough, we can get enthused about tomorrow. Because with the Holy Spirit's leading, our walk with Jesus can just keep getting better every day. No doubt there are aches and hurts and pains that go along with growing older. There are sorrows and heartaches that will weigh heavy on us. We'll face disappointments and troubles. But we have a choice. We can focus on all those things that dishearten and discourage us, and we can be miserable. Or, we can focus on what God has done for us in Christ Jesus and on what the Holy Spirit is doing within us. And we can focus on what God has prepared ahead of us and we can be enthused. Boy, am I enthused. And it's my prayer that by the time you get to the car this morning, and maybe even by the time you get home today, that you will remember that what Christ has done in us can make a difference about how we look at life and how we live the life that we have, and that your life will be changed positively because the Holy Spirit lives within. Father, help us this day to be enthused about what you're doing in us. Help us today to seek all that you have for us and to be excited because each tomorrow will get increasingly better. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Stand with us as we sing. I have a song I long to sing since I have been free. My Redeemer Savior.
of your Holy Spirit and give them a joy that this world cannot take away. In your name we pray. Amen. <laughs> 